hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name. Hallelujah, Lord God. Hallelujah. Glory to God in the highest. We magnify your great name, O God. You are awesome and mighty, sovereign and holy. There's no one like you in all the earth, O God. Thank you, Lord God. Lord, we bless your name today. You are the good shepherd, the bishop of our souls, O oh God. And we bless you, who you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We honor you, King Jesus. Well, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for tuning in tonight to the, to the uh, Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church Bible Class, which is uh, the Tuesday night Bible class. Tuesday night Bible class. I call it the bread of life. Because I tell you, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, God will fill you. He will satisfy you. And tonight, we want to open up a word of prayer, and we're going to get into our lesson we've been talking about, about the spirit of rejection. We started on last week, and we're still in the book, The Bait of Satan, being delivered, living free from the deadly trap of offense. We're talking about, as we started on last week, how could this happen to me? We also discussed a love-hate relationship between Saul and David, how Saul became envious of David because God appointed David to be the next king due to Saul's rebellious acts of disobeying God's order and commands. So Saul ended up losing his position as king, so the anointing that left him and went to David. And because of this, Saul was very angry with David when he sought to kill him on many occasions. And each time he got close, God always delivered David out of the hand of, of Saul, where Saul could not touch him. Even when David had the chance to kill Saul himself when Saul was asleep, he never touched him. He tore off a piece of his, clo his clothing and he showed him that he could have taken his life, but he didn't do it. And that's uh, the grace of God. So, so many times the enemy come against us to destroy us, but yet God keeps us secure in his presence. So I want to encourage you tonight, get in your word, study the word, read 1 Samuel, the 24th chapter. Read that chapter, the entire chapter, and I tell you, you'll find it interesting in how God will begin to speak to your heart concerning your life, lining up with the word of God, even in the midst of rejection and loneliness and pain and hurt, disappointment, discouragement. God himself will speak by his spirit to you to build you up in your faith. Good, uh, good evening, Lashonda. Thank you for joining. God bless. So let's go into the word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for this day you created. We thank you for your love and kindness, your mercy, and your grace bestowed upon us again, oh God. We thank you for this moment to share your word. Speak to our hearts, oh God, by divine revelation from the knowledge of the word of God that we get an insight. Even be convicted to change, oh God, areas in our life that need to be changed, that we walk by faith and not by sight into the promise of your word, that you will be glorified. Lord, I thank you for the victory in Christ Jesus, for you are great, oh God. You are awesome. You are mighty. I speak healing in the atmosphere, God, upon your people, God. Everyone that needs healing tonight, God, as you touch right now, Father, in a supernatural way to drive away the infirmity of sickness and disease, oh God, to bring them peace in their minds, their hearts, their soul, their will, their emotions, that they rest in the finished work of the cross, believing it by faith and by your stripes, they are healed. Then, Lord God, forgive for our sins, knowing unknowingly, Father God, and washing the blood of the Lamb, that we have nothing to hinder us from walking in obedience to your word by the Holy Spirit. We ask that you be glorified tonight, O God, and we thank you as I decrease, you increase. Now receive, O oh God, a ram of word from the heart of God to speak by the Spirit of the living God that will help transform the minds and hearts of those that have ears to hear this word, what the Spirit says to the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Last week was really a, a profound lesson. We discussed how David was be, uh, being pursued by King Saul, how many times he tried his best to take... David's life, David always escaped, even hid in a cave, him and his soldiers, because he, uh, Saul turned away, 
turned against him and his soldiers. Those who were supporting David, he turned against them as well. So it's like so many times when we try to do right, the enemy always plotting and planning for our demise to destroy us. But nevertheless, God always has a way to escape when the enemy comes against you. He said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, he himself will lift a standard against him. That's the power of God he has in your life, my brother, my sister, that no matter what the enemy plot and plan against you, God will protect you. God will shield you. God will keep you secure in his presence. All you got to do is just stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Notice that God, not the devil, placed David under the care of Saul. Why would God only allow this but also plan it? Why was favor dangled before David's eyes only to have it abruptly taken away? We talked about this last week, how this was a setup, but yet trying to be a disappointment. So when sometimes when God has a calling on your life and it seems like things are going well for a season and all of a sudden it's snatched from under you. And you wonder, God, I did everything you told me to do. I prayed, I fasted, I set the plan in motion. I wrote down the vision. I let people know about the vision that those who are supportive to me will see the vision, run with me to see the thing successful in my life. But yet, old Slewfoot always got to put his, his nose in the plan to bring a disruption and a distraction in the plan that God has for your life. Just because it may be delayed don't mean it's denied. Just because it may be delayed is not denied. Just because distractions come and issues arise in your planning and the decision you decided to make does not mean it's denied. Ooh, that's good. Because what God has given you to do it's a guarantee that God himself will fulfill the calling and the plan he has for you to do in your life. No matter how long the process may be, the end result, God gets the glory. So you got to have your mind made up that no matter what comes against me, I'm going to stand on the word of God. And trust God and his word to manifest what he called me to do. Saul was so determined to kill this young man at any cost that his madness increased. You hear what I just said? Saul was determined. The devil is determined to kill you. The devil is determined to turn you back to your vomit. The devil is determined to stop you from walking and fulfilling the plan and the will that God has for your life. At any cost, he's determined he's about to kill your son, kill your daughter, kill your mother, kill your father to distract you. Kill your finances, kill your health. He want to do anything he can to distract you at any cost. And it says that Saul was so angry, his madness increased. It became intensified. Just, it reminds me of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When the king made a decree at the sound of the sat flutes, the sat, the sat, sabas, the sat flutes, all these different things, the flutes, the harps, and all these different instruments, the sat bus, the, the flutes and harps, at the sound of all these instruments, that everyone in the kingdom has to bow down and worship the idol God. The three Hebrew boys had a stern conviction to serve their God under any circumstance. Refused to bow down under any circumstance. No matter how much pressure was against them, how much the king even made a decree being tricked to do this, that if you don't bow down at the sound of the trumpet, the harp, the flute, the sack, both all these instruments, you're going to be thrown in fiery furnace. 
Then the king said, heat the fire up seven times hotter than normal. He want to make sure you die in the fire. And the fire was so intensified that the men, when they didn't bow to this idol God, went to throw them in the fire. The fire burned them up. Why? It's just like anger. Anger becomes so intensified <coughs> that anyone in the pathway of the flame of the fire will be consumed. That's how the enemy does. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy the plan, the purpose, the will that God has for your life. So the fire becomes intensified. The enemy wants to do anything to make you angry, make you upset, make you uptight, make you turn away from God. But the Spirit of God that's inside of you will not let you bow down under pressure. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though they heard the king clearly, they heard his decree, they knew what he was telling them to do, they refused to obey the king. They refused to turn away from their God. And they trust their God to even to the point saying, even though king, if you throw us in the fire and our God don't deliver us from the fire and out of our hand, we still ain't going to bow. <coughs> that's, that's a sureness of your devotion to the Lord. Your confidence you have in your God that even if I lost my house, I lost my car. My finances are depreciated. My health is failing. My mind is in confusion. Even at that point, <coughs> excuse me, I got allergies bothering me tonight, y'all. Excuse me, but I'm going to try to do this anyway. Even at the point where everything is starting to fail in my life, I have such faith in God that even if he don't bring me out of it, I know he can. And that's the kind of faith we need to have in God for ourselves today. Even if God don't deliver you at the moment you need to be delivered, sometimes God lets you stay in situations to get you to a place where you test your loyalty and your dependence upon him to make sure you're sure about who you serve even though he can deliver you. He became a desperate man, priest in the city of Nob, provided David with shelter, food, and Goliath's sword. They knew nothing about David running from Saul and thought he was on a mission for the king. They inquired of the Lord on David's behalf and sent him on his way. Check this out. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 11. It says, Moreover, my father, see ye the skirt of thy robe in my hand. For in, the, for in that I cut off thy skirt of thy robe and killed thee not, know thou and see it that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand. And I have not sinned against thee, yet thou hauntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but my hand shall not be upon thee. David loved Saul even when the opportunity presented itself to get revenge. He refused to take vengeance in his own hands. He left it in the hand of God. Even though Saul hunted to take his life, he loved Saul so much, even in the point, if you have to kill me, then you know what? My God going to protect me. I'm not going to even fear you. I'm not going to let you take my life. Because I know my God is going to avenge me of you. That's what he was pretty much saying. So when Saul, it says, when Saul found out 
He was furious. He killed 85 innocent priests of the Lord and put the entire city of Nob to the sword. Every man, woman, child, nursing infant, cow, donkey, and sheep. He killed everything, my God, my God, that had life in it. He carried judgment against them, the innocent, that he was supposed to carry against the Amalekites. He was a murderer. How could God have ever put his spirit in such a man? How many times you came across someone in the church and you wonder why God even wanted to use that individual because their character, their integrity doesn't line up with the spirit of God. The reason why is because God knows every individual who he calls. Not only that, he placed his spirit in every individual he wants to use, even if they're drunkard, even if they're drug addict, even if they're a prostitute or a pimp behind closed doors. God is going to use who he chooses to use to bring conviction to turn people's lives to him, even a sinner. God can use a sinner man to convict the saved man to come back to the Lord when he out of order. Nevertheless, he knows the fate of their life. That even if I use them, there's a possibility of the individual having a conviction of heart and repenting. So God knows when your opportunity of change is going to take place. That's why God uses even people like Saul. Saul was a murderer. You see, he didn't do what God told him to do when he told him to kill the Malachites. He kept the king alive, took the best of the spoils, took the gold, the silver. The things God told him don't take and don't do, he did the opposite. And yet God used Saul anyway, even to the point he ended up losing his life. Because God spoke a word through the prophet Samuel and told him, because you rejected God, the Lord has rejected you from being king. The more you walk in rebellion as a child of God, you're rejecting God. You're rejecting his anointing. You're rejecting his ability to save you. His, you're rejecting his, his ability to forgive you. But God never changes his mind about you. You change your mind about him. That's a very dangerous position to be in. We were talking about, we did our recording for the radio show today. Because tomorrow I have a funeral that I have to conduct. Um, um, for a family friend of mine that lives in my building. And we were talking about why does it take so long for some people to turn their life over to the Lord? God has given us his word. The word is preached on the airways, the radio stations, in the grocery stores. No matter where you go, there's a possibility of running across some entity that has the word of God and the words being preached to you. But yet, we feel I have time. We feel like I can live my life the way I choose to live my life. And when I get good and ready, I'm going to give my life to the Lord. That is so dangerous because you never know the day nor the hour when your life is going to end. God has a timing for every individual when your life is going to end. And you need to make up your mind and make your decision up that I am going to live my life to the full and repent and give myself to God. God is so merciful. I was looking at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And it says, And you have he quickened, 
who were dead in trespasses and in sin and sins wherein time passed you walk according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now working in the children of disobedience so when you tell yourself I have time to give my life to Jesus you're walking in delusional mindset you're walking in deception you're walking in disobedience because when you feel within yourself that I can clean myself up, I can stop drinking, I can stop smoking, stop doing drugs, stop fornicating, stop adulterating, stop lying, stop stealing. I can stop all this stuff because I choose to do it. You just told God, I don't need you. I'm rejecting you. And the word of God tells us that this spirit... What spirit? The spirit of disobedience is working in the ones who feel they have time. So if you're one of those who've been going to church Sunday after Sunday, week after week, and you still ain't turning your life around, and you're just going through the cycle of religious system, you need to have conviction in your heart to tell God, God, I need you. Come into my heart, cleanse my mind, take away the iniquity in my heart, God, purify my thoughts. I want to receive salvation. I want to see, receive Jesus, Lord and Savior. Come and save me. Guess what? With the mouth, confession is made, and with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. So your salvation, it comes from the moment you make up your mind to serve God. I tell you, this is something because the spirit of rejection is still working in families today where they can't get along with one another because I don't like what you said to me a year ago or 20 years ago. You hurt me. My father hurt me. My mother hurt me. My brother and sister hurt me. My children hurt me. So I never got over the pain and the brokenness of being hurt in rejection. So allow that spirit of disobedience to settle in my heart to keep me alienated and a stranger from God who has the power and the ability to turn my life around. My God, this is good. This is enriching. This is enriching. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And precious. My God, my God. That, that's a good word right there. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Let me go to the full scripture. It's just partial scripture here in my notes here. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to read this in the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It says, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. You know what that means? Cornerstone is a stone that holds the bricks together. So without the cornerstone, the bricks going to fall. You got to have something solid in place. When you're building an edifice and you're building the bricks and the foundation and all that, you got to have that cornerstone. So it says, you're coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of what? God's temple. You're God's temple. I'm God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Isn't that awesome? Rejected by people, but chosen by God for great honor. So today we're benefactors of honoring God. Every time I give myself to the Lord and I worship him and praise his holy name, I'm honoring God. And because of Christ who lives inside of me, now I can honor him. First, I mean, St. John, St. John chapter 15, verse 18. 
St. John chapter 15, verse 18. It says, if the world hate you or reject you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus told disciples, if the world rejects you, despise you, they hated me first, despised me first, rejected me first. So it's a guarantee as a child of God, you're going to be rejected. It's a guarantee as a child of God, you're going to be hurt. You're going to be wounded. You're going to be bruised. You're going to be scarred. However, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, I mean, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, if you know the story, is when Paul has sought the Lord three times to remove a thorn in his flesh. Your rejection might be a thorn to you. The pain and the despisement, the hurts, the disappointments might be in your heart has scarred you. And you ask God to heal it, to take it away, but you haven't fully surrendered. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So when you're weak in your strength, and don't have the ability to let go of the rejection and the despisement of people, God says, that's okay. I can handle this. I got this. If you let me in, I got this for you. So he's saying, my strength, my strength is made perfect, complete in your weakness. So in your weakness, I have an exchange to give you my strength. So he says, my strength overpowers your weakness that you can be delivered from the rejection. I just got that in the spirit. That's so powerful. He said, most gladly, and this is Paul speaking, he said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Because of God's grace has the ability to overpower my weakness, he said, you know what? Then I give up. I surrender. So now I can glory in my infirmities, my rejection, my pain, my hurts, my brokenness. I can glory. I can praise you, Jesus. In the midst of everything I went through, I can praise you that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Glory to God. That's shouting news. Somebody needs to send some hands up on that one. Y'all need to be praising God on that one. Because God is letting you know tonight that I am the one that I am. The great I am. Say, my grace is sufficient that I can cause you the glory in your weakness that my power will manifest in you. Glory to God in the highest. Woo! I tell you, I preach my own stuff happy on that one. Glory to God. Glory to God. So then it goes on. It says one point Saul learned David was in the wilderness of Engedi and set out after him with 3,000 warriors. It take that many soldiers to find one man and kill him. 3,000 warriors he gathered to pursue one man. Which reminds me, I talked about this last week, how when the soldiers, about three, three, four thousand soldiers, they came to arrest Jesus. And when they came to arrest Jesus, the power of God was so strong upon him and in him. When Judas said, here he is, and he kissed them, said, this is the one you arrest. The power knocked them all off their feet. Don't you think God could have did the same thing for David? When Saul came out there with these three thousand soldiers, he could have very well knocked them all down. But instead, God kept letting David flee out of his hands. So David, he fled from Saul, and Saul never had the ability to kill him. So then it goes on. It says, during that journey, 
they stopped to rest at the entrance of a cave, not knowing David was hiding in the back. See how God set this up? God set Saul up. You trying to kill my servant, who is going to be the next king, but he has the power to kill you. Because I got him in the same cave you hiding in. Or you came to rest in. Then it says, Saul removed his outer robe and laid it aside. And David quietly slipped out of his hiding place and cut off a piece of the discarded robe and crept away without being noticed. See how God protected David? Even the soldiers, 3,000 soldiers. Are y'all paying attention to this? 3,000 soldiers were resting and David slipped through them all. My God, as the Saul left the cave, David bowed down to the ground and cried out after him, My father, see, yes, the corner of your robe is in my hand. Know and see that there is neither evil nor rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, yet you haunt to take my life. First Samuel 24, 11, we read that earlier. David cried to Saul, my father, my father, to put it plainly, he was crying, see my heart be a father to me. I need a leader to train me, not to destroy me. Even while Saul was trying to kill, David's heart still burned with hope. He still had an anticipation in his heart that hopefully Saul would have a change of mind. It would change his heart from pursuing to kill him. Because he looked up to Saul as a father. And Jonathan was his brother, was Saul's son. David had a love for Saul like a, a father. And the worst rejection a child can have in today's time is rejection of a father. When the father turns his back on you, say, that ain't my child. I don't know that child. I don't want to have anything to do with that child. That's a painful thing for a child. And yet God, he says, you know what? I know you've been through rejection. I know you've been despised. I know you've been hurt, been an outcast, forsaken, abandoned. Yet I promise if you let me in your heart, I'll be a father to the fatherless, a mother to the motherless. I'll even be your brother and your sister. I'll be everything you need me to be that you can find peace in your heart and healing and deliverance. But yet, we still live in the place of regret and resentment because I refuse to let go of rejection. Where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? I have seen this cry in countless men and women in the body of Christ. Most of them are young, and with a strong call of God on their lives, they cry out for a father, a man to disciple, a man to disciple, to love and support and encourage them. This is why God said he would turn the hearts of the fathers, leaders, children to the people and the heart of the children to their father, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Malachi chapter 4 verse 6. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. God says he turning the hearts of the fathers, the love of the fathers back to their children and their children back to the love of loving their fathers. Unless he strike the earth with a curse because they refuse to give in to his will and repent of the evil hearts. We're living in that time well, God wants to heal our nation. He wants to restore families. Bring the children back. He wants to do a great work in all of our lives. Only if we have a repentful heart. I keep saying it because God is letting us know you need to repent of the sin and the habits and addiction you have that's not of God. Because God wants to restore you. But he can't do it when your heart is filthy. You're still holding on to rejection. You're rejecting God from delivering from cigarettes, rejecting God from delivering from alcohol, rejecting God from delivering you from any type of sin in your heart. You reject him. God said you reject me, I reject you. 
because you refuse to turn to the Lord. Our nation lost its fathers, dads, leaders, or ministers in the 1940s and 1950s. And today our condition is getting worse. It's getting worse. Not unlike Saul, many leaders in our homes, corporations, and churches are more concerned with their goals than with their offsprings. We know that's true. We might have, you might be one of those that did that yourself. More concerned about your job than your family or your children. Because of this attitude, le these leaders view God's people as resources to serve their vision instead of seeing the vision as a vehicle to serve the people. That's an attitude, malfunction. An attitude is malfunction. It's not programmed the way God wants to be. So I'd rather have the people serve my vision instead of me serving them. Jesus says it like this. Whoever desires to be the greatest in the kingdom, you must first be a servant. I got to serve you. You got to serve me in order to be a child of God in the kingdom. We have to have a heart to serve one another. And that's what God is looking for, people who is willing to say, Lord, I need you to come into my heart. Change my mind. Change my attitude. Change my life. I want to serve you as I serve my brothers and sisters the way you want me to serve them. And in so doing, I'm serving the Lord in obedience. I'm serving the Lord in love and compassion. And when I have compassion for the homeless, people we pass on the streets, and the Lord says, give them some money or pray for them. You never know the impact of the love that God just demonstrated through your life to the individual. I remember one occasion, me and my fiance was riding through Illinois going to uh, Indiana. And we stopped at one of the oasis. And there was this couple sitting outside the entrance. And they said they had just lost their home. They lost their jobs. And they were homeless. And they were looking for something to eat. So people would pass them by. Some people would buy them food. And so I said, what, what do you need me to do? And the man said, just pray for me. That's all he wanted. For somebody to take a time and pray for them and his wife. And you know what? We did just that. We stopped and prayed for that couple and gave them money. And said, go buy you something to eat. Because God put it in our hearts. In order to be a servant of the Most High God, you got to serve God's people. No matter how they look, how dirty they look, how filthy they look before your eyes, you still got to serve them. Because people, all they're looking for in life is to be loved. That's what God is looking for you and I, my brother, my sister, is to demonstrate the love of God for one another. And because of this, the, the couple was grateful. They were grateful. Check this out. The success of the vision justifies the cost of the wounded lives and shattered people. The success of the vision justifies the cost of wounded lives and shattered people. Justice Mercy, integrity, love are compromised for success. That's, that's, that's bad. That's really bad right there. Because I'd rather compromise people's lives to make myself successful. You ever seen people who have stepped over you to get to the, a certain plateau in life and care less where you are? Don't care about bringing you up, making you better? It's only about themselves. Pastors do it all the time. They want everybody to give to them but I'm not giving back to the community. I want you to pay my bills for the church and my family, but I can care less when you have a need. And every shepherd that God called, qualified, appointed, and anointed in such a time as this to preach the gospel is required and has a responsibility of caring for the sheep. If you're not caring for the sheep, and you're bleeding the sheep, you're taking everything they have and care less if they're making it or not, 
God is going to hold you accountable. He's going to judge you with a stricter judgment because you knew to do what's right and you chose not to do it. This opens the door to treatment such as David received after all Saul had a kingdom to protect. It's, it's, this is something here. Saul being the king over, over Israel, his responsibility was not to be pursuing David. It's governing and ruling the kingdom. He had mixed priorities because he put his madness and anger before God's order to take care of his people to pursuing David and take his life. If you are one of those who have mixed priorities, where God is taking the bottom of the list and you put everything else above God, you need to change that. Because in order to be successful in life, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God needs to be at the top priority of your list. Everything else follows secondary to the order after God in the first, first place of your list. Everything you need, God promises. He will take care of it when you take care of him first. People don't like this type of teaching because when God says we are to give a first fruit of all our increase before the Lord, he said he will bless you. We get mad about stuff like that. Because when we don't obey God in his word, we're telling God, God, your word ain't good enough. Because I have to do things my way to take care of myself first and I give you what you need secondary. That, that's out of order. That's out of order with God. And God is telling us tonight, get your priorities in order. In Proverbs chapter 3, we all quote this scripture all the time. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. People can quote it in their sleep. And they, they talk about this all the time. I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version. In the Amplified Version, it says, check this out. Lean on. Who are you leaning on tonight? Who are you leaning on when you go to work? Who are you leaning on when it comes to needing money? Who are you leaning on? So lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on on your own insight and understanding. Lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight and understanding. Because if I lean on my own insight, the way I perceive things, when I, I read the Word of God, my own knowledge of the Word of God, and not the Spirit's knowledge, guess what? I'm going to mess up. But when I lean on the insight, and the understanding from the Holy Spirit, he takes me to a deeper realm of knowledge that I can get a rhema word from the word of God to apply to my heart to change my life and the life of somebody else. Verse 6. In all your ways, know. Know what? How to trust in the Lord. How to lean on the Lord. How to depend on God. In all your ways, know. Recognize and acknowledge him. All your ways, know, recognize, acknowledge who? Christ, who's in your life. And he says, and he will, Christ, God will, direct and make straight and plain your path. Smooth. The rough place in your life, the crooked place in your life, he'll make plain. Smooth. Then you go on verse 8. For actually, we go to seven. So five, six, seven, eight, and nine and ten. It goes on like this. In all your ways, we just read that verse seven, be not wise in your own eyes. So you can't walk in your wisdom. When your problems get heated, situations get heated, you have heated, heated arguments with people, you can't walk in your own wisdom. You get disgusted with people, you can't walk in your own wisdom. Be not wise your own eyes, but reverently, reverently fear and worship the Lord and turn entirely away from evil. 
So if I'm reverently fearing, I'm mindful, I'm conscious of who God is in my life to where I respect him. That word fear is not to be, oh, I'm frightened of God because he's going to destroy me. Don't act right. No, it's on my respect. Honor him. And worship the Lord and turn entirely away from evil. Then it goes on, verse 8. I love verse 8. I've been reading this for years. It shall be health to your nerves and sinews, flesh, and marrow, the substance in your bones, and moistening to your bones, the ligaments, the ligaments, and the joints, and the marrows, all these things in your body. He said this word, when you trust in the Lord, rely, lean on and confidently depend on God. He said, this word, when you get insight, knowledge, and revelation of who God is, he said, this word here would give you health. So the reason a lot of folk in the body of Christ are still sick, because there's a spirit of sickness you are allowed to come into your life. I understand many people have different issues, and different conditions because of their health that's declining. But some things, it's a spiritual sickness because of rebellion, because of stubbornness, because of pride, because of arrogance and hostiness. And the spirit of sickness will make you sick when you can't get well until you repent. When people are stuck in drug addiction, alcoholism, adultery, all types of sinful acts, and you don't repent, you allow yourself to be entertained by a spirit of sickness. So the spiritual sickness that got you addicted. It's a spiritual sickness to keep you in bondage. Spiritual sickness keep you in prison. And you won't come out until you repent. And when you repent before God, God says, you know what? I got you. I will set you free. I will deliver you. I will bring you out victoriously. I will break the curse off your life. I will bless you when you turn to me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your will, and emotion, and love me. My God, my God, my God. Man, time is going quick. Verse 9. Verse 9. It says, Honor the Lord with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors, your money, your increase. God says, honor me with your increase from your labor. So you work, God says, honor me. And with the first fruits of all your income, God says, you honor me from the first fruits of your substance, your income, your in I will increase, I will bless you. Check this out. He says, with the first fruits of all your increase. And then he said, verse 10 is in conjunction to verse 9. If I obey verse 9, then verse 10 will be applied to my heart. Because he said in verse 10, so, your, so shall your storage places be filled with plenty. Your bank account. Your 401k. Your CDs. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty. And your vats shall be overflowing with new wine. He's talking about that heart. The Holy Spirit will fill you. He will increase you. He will bless you. Cause you to live in the overflow. And then he will fill you with the wine of the Spirit. Where you never run dry. The reason why so many people in the body of Christ. Begin to run dry in the anointing. Because you're not giving God what he asked you to do in verse 9. Given the answer first of all your increase. When you honor God and you put him first, God will honor you. God will put you first. He'll make sure everything you need is taken care of. He'll make sure your children are blessed. Not only that, he told Moses, tell the children of Israel, he said, I'm going to bless you. He said, not only that, when you go into the land of Canaan, Florida, milk and honey, he said, you and your children are going to be blessed, and their children's children are going to be blessed. So all the descendants connected to you are going to benefit from your obedience. When you obey God, God says, 
Everything connected to you is going to be blessed. How many leaders have cut off men under them because of suspicion? Why are those leaders suspicious? Because they are not serving God. If you are a leader and you always find yourself suspicious of people, check your relationship with God. Because there's somewhere in there you, you done got off track and stopped trusting and serving God. You, you're trusting and serving your instincts and your ability to judge people and not God. Because they're not serving God, they are serving a vision. If you're in a ministry and all they're doing is serving a vision, you need to run. Get out of there. Because they don't have your interest at heart. Like Saul they were insecure of their calling and that breeds jealousy and pride. When you're insecure of the calling God placed on your life, the anointing God placed on your life, you put yourself in a position of jealousy and pride. And God is saying tonight, the Holy Spirit has the power to break it off your mindset because it all goes back to here, the mindset. They recognize the quality in people that they know are godly and they are willing to use those people as long as it, check this out, benefits them. As long as it benefits them, they're going to use you. Just like I've been to a ministry before because I can sing very well. Pastor didn't care nothing about my preaching anointing. All he wanted me to do is sing. And the Holy Spirit checked me one day and says, you're not just called to be a singer. You call to preach the gospel. You're in the wrong place. You need to get out of there. And guess what? I left that church, but I left in obedience. I left with respect because I obeyed God. And I went before the leader and told him that God has instructed me to leave this ministry because I was only here for a season to do what I had been doing in the church. And when God planted me in the place I needed to be, I flourished in the anointing, the healing anointing, the preaching anointing, the teaching anointing, all began to increase upon my life because now I was walking in my divine calling in the order of the Spirit of God he placed upon my life. Saul enjoyed the success of David until he saw him as a threat. Saul enjoyed the success of David until he saw David as a threat. I want to tell you this point. We're going to end on this point. I'm going to read this next statement and then we're going to end on this point. He then demoted David and watched for a reason to destroy him. We talked about this last week. But I'm just recapping it because God had put in my spirit to go over it again. Because a lot of people will get intimidated because of your anointing. When you know that you are powerful in God and you surrender to his lordship, his authority, and God used you mightily in the kingdom of God, people are going to get jealous of their anointing. They're going to see you as a threat. To their ministry, many pastors, I'm going to say this, because many pastors will get jealous of who you are. I've been in churches where pastors were jealous of my anointing. And they did everything in their power to keep me from you being used by God. But I tell you this, every time the Spirit of God came upon me to prophesy, I obeyed God. Whether they liked it or they didn't like it, I spoke what God said to speak. And sometimes I spoke a prophetic word and God said, now leave. I went to one church in, in Texas before when I was married. And this pastor was a white pastor. And they let all the white people be used in leadership. And I had to be on the praise team. And they would make excuses. So I would come to the rehearsals. I would sit, but they never let me sing. And I say, God, what is it? God says, they prejudice. Not only that, God says that the people here been praying that God will send them people of multicultural to this church. But when I sent them, they rejected them and they left. When God spoke to me, immediately after church, they were having a new pastor come into this church to take over. And the new pastor asked me to come to the church meeting after church. But I went to him before 
I went to him and the, the pastor was there. And I said, God said, you've been praying that he sent people into your ministry of multicultural. And God said, every time he send them and they have a gift that they want, they want to use in your church, you reject them and turn them away. God said he's not pleased with it. He said, you need to repent and allow God to fill this house the way he chooses to fill it. And God is going to clean the house, take away people, and he's going to restore in this house the ones that need to be there. I spoke that word. That pastor looked at me in surprise and unbelief. Like, how could this man tell me something like this? But the new pastor was listening. So I want you to come to the church meeting. And I came to the church meeting. And he says, I want you to stand up before all the people here and tell them what God said. I spoke the same word before the congregation. And I spoke that word with boldness by the Holy Ghost. And I spoke that word not being fearful or intimidated of how people looked at me or what they thought about me. And I said, and because of this, me and my family, we do not feel welcome in this place. We're leaving. And we got up and we walked out that church. And that pastor called me later on that evening. He said, I truly want to apologize to you for the way they did not respect the anointing on your life. He said, forgive us and pray that we do better. Because we don't want to be displeasing to God when God sent people to this house. And I said, you know what? I would definitely do that. And I prayed for that pastor at that moment. And I hung up. Because you're going to find people intimidated when you're black and you're powerful in the things of God. Folk will get intimidated. They will, will reject you. They're going to slander you. They're going to try to discourage you. They're going to try to hurt you. But when you put on the armor of God, the full armor of God, and you walk with your head up high and your chest stuck out in boldness by the Holy Ghost, who cares what people think? Who cares how they feel about you? Who cares what they say about you? Because what God has ordained for you to do, the devil in hell cannot stop it from happening. So I want to encourage you tonight. Walk in your anointing. Walk in your calling. Ephesians 4 and 1. Paul said, Brother, I beseech thee by the mercy of God that you walk worthy of your vocation wherewith you have been called. Walk in your calling. Your vocation is your job. Your vocation is your calling. Your vocation is the gift God placed on your life. He said, Now walk in it with authority. Walk with boldness. And when you walk in the divine order according to the will of God, God says, I will elevate you. Humble thyself before the Lord your God and he will he'll lift you up. He'll lift you up. He'll lift you up upon people who've been there over 30, 40 years. It doesn't matter how long they've been there. No matter how long they've been in that position, God will remove them and put you in it. Because it's all about you and your obedience to his will. Even on your job, you've been passed over on promotions. God says, you stay humble. Keep doing your job as unto the Lord. He'll elevate you. He will cause you to step above the one who been pushing you down. Like the crabs in the bucket. You take a bucket full of crabs, a crawfish, and every time one climbs the wall to try to climb out, the other ones keep pulling them back. God said, don't worry about that. I'll deal with the naysayers. I'll deal with the haters. I'll deal with the backbiters. I'll deal with the, the tail bearers. He said, I'll deal with them. You don't worry about it. You do what I instructed you to do in obedience and I will exalt you in due season. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this word tonight, O oh God. 
I pray this word has not fallen upon deaf ears, but it convicts all of our hearts to examine ourselves to see how am I living my life for you, God? Am I walking with a spirit of rejection in my heart, rebellion, stubbornness, pridefulness, haughtiness? Or am I willing to submit to your lordship and your authority that you can heal my brokenness and deliver me, oh God, from every sin in my heart that's not of you? Father, I ask that you do it for your glory. As we heard this word tonight, oh God, let the word sink into our hearts, prick our hearts, and change our mindsets to have a desire to want to love you with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, our will, and our emotions. And I thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. If you love this lesson, I want you to send up some hearts if you love this lesson tonight. I, I tell you, I really enjoyed myself tonight. I, I enjoyed the Spirit of God speaking through me because I know it's nobody but God. I, I tell you, God is doing a great work in this kingdom. And if you're listening by the Spirit, you're going to be part of that kingdom. I tell you, God, God is doing something in all of our lives. And we together, and maybe a few of us tonight listening to this word, but that's okay because I pray that those who hear this word even after today will be convicted by the Holy Spirit to want to change their hearts change their lives, and allow the God to come in and do an operation in their lives to change them to be who he wants them to be. So if you're one tonight and you know that you're in a backslidden state of mind, your heart has slipped back into sin, and the word told us to flee fornication, flee, flee adultery, flee from sin, and all the different things said to do, and you know you've been dipping and tipping back into the things God delivered you from, and you might be one that don't know Jesus, Lord and Savior. And the word says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but shall have everlasting life. If you're one of those that if thou shalt confess thy mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in thy heart that God is raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You can be saved tonight by praying this simple prayer with me. I want us all to repeat this simple prayer in one accord. Because someone might be ashamed to even pray this prayer. But I want you to pray this prayer in their behalf. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask the Lord you come into my heart. Forgive me for my sin, knowing and unknowingly. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Cleanse my mind, cleanse my heart, and change my life. Now come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me. In Jesus name. Now fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. Baptize me in the spirit of the living God. That I will be a witness for you. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. 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 If you prayed that prayer tonight. The whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner. Who turned their life over to the Lord. And I tell you we're rejoicing with you. We're excited because God's kingdom is increasing and the devil's kingdom is being defeated every time a, soul, a sinner turns his life over to the Lord. I thank you all for tuning in tonight. I see uh, Courtney on tonight, my sister, future sister, Lala B, and I see my fiance on tonight, and Deacon Alec, and many other of you, my cousin Jackie, God bless you, Minister Eric, v uh, Sister Vivian, God bless you, Deaconess Vivian. Got uh, Pastor Denise is on tonight. Uh, Weston, my friend, is on tonight. Many other names. Pastor uh, Deborah Hill and all of you. I tell you, it's such a blessing. Uh, I saw one of my friends, Tony, on tonight. Anthony Haas, God bless you for joining in tonight. Thank you all again, again, again. If you want to sow a seed into the ministry, the link is on. It's pinned on at the bottom of the comment section if you want to sow a seed into the ministry sow your seed this this is very uh enriching because when you sow seed in the kingdom of god god sows back into you every single time and that's one thing you're gonna find out i'm not gonna beg for money from nobody i don't beg for that. i just praise god for in advance because i know god will always provide every time i pray and thank god for favor and increase in my life he does it every single time it's so some people sow, some people don't. It's okay because I, I'm still going to trust God 
that he will touch your hearts one day to sow a seed into this ministry because it goes into the church for the building of the kingdom of God. Even for the materials that I do to teach these lessons each week, I thank God for the increase in favor on all of our life and give us a heart of obedience to do as he says in his word, to give and to come back to us, good measures, pressed down, shaken together, shall men give you a bosom as it runs over. God said, you give, it's going to run over into your life. Not only your life, but the lives of your children and your children's children will benefit from your seed being sown tonight. And guess what? God gives the increase on your seed. Because when you sow a seed, he reigns on that seed with his anointing. And anointing causes it to flourish and causes it to prosper in the kingdom of God. So you all stay encouraged, stay excited about Jesus tonight and know that God loves you and I love you too. Now may the grace of God the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide in our hearts until we meet again. Lord, may, may you be gracious to your people, turn your face towards them, O oh God, that you call them to be blessed in everything they do and everywhere they go, O oh God, that you, Father God, will shower favor and grace upon their lives. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Any questions tonight? Any questions before we go? Any questions? Got any questions? You feel free to inbox me your questions as well. You want to inbox me a question later on, something come across your mind or something you've been studying and you don't understand, feel free to inbox me. I encourage you to inbox me if you have anything concerning the Word of God you don't understand. I don't mind sharing the wisdom and knowledge God has given me to help His people grow in knowledge and the, and the truth of His Word, to get a deeper insight and knowledge and understanding of what God is speaking through His Word to all of us. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't do it without you. Doesn't matter how many people come on, whether it's two or three gathering his name, he promised to be in the midst. And truly, God has shown up tonight on this lesson. I felt his presence like a fire upon me, and it's just burning in my soul. So, you all stay excited about Jesus and walk by faith and not by sight. Put a smile on somebody's face. You may be concerned about situations in your life or life of somebody else, but don't allow it to consume you. Walk in, in, in your purpose. For a purpose. Walk in your purpose for purpose. Today is a great day to make it a great day. Make a decision in your heart tonight. I'm going to have a blessed evening and a highly favored and abundant evening in the presence of God. And I tell you, when you do that, God himself will sleep right next to you in your bed. He will cover you like a blanket. He will provide for you, protect you, and keep you secure in his presence. Until we meet again, shalom. Peace, blessings, and favor be upon you. Good night, everybody. Hallelujah.